Um, yeah. So, I mean, we have all of these, like Frankenstein has inspired so many. And we can't, okay, we can't, can't forget the monsters. Oh, of course. Yeah, I Fred love Gwynn. the monsters. Yep. Herman Munster was the best. Yep. <laughs> and one more that Rachel may not be familiar with is the hilarious House of Frightenstein. Oh, of course. No, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, Yep, I watched that as a kid. My imagination escaped me. Did Gene Walder, uh, was he part of a Frankenstein movie? Well, that was was the, yeah, that was the 1974. That was the the 1974 Young Frankenstein. It was hilarious. Because I love Gene Walder. I'm a big fan. And that was a a really fun spoof on on Frankenstein, but and brilliantly acted, of course, and written by Mel Brooks, right? So and uh, it had so many well-known people who were comedians at the time. You know, you had, gosh, everybody was in that film. Uh, (laughs) I'm trying to think. See, and Gene Walder was was Victor Frankenstein. Um, you had Peter Boyle as the monster, Terry Garr, Cloris Leachman, Marty Feldman was Igor, Madeline Kahn, uh, Kenneth Mars was in that, Gene Hackman was in it. I mean, there was just, it was chock-a-block with, and of course, like all, um, you know, all Mel Brooks films, just totally over the top with innuendo and funny little, you know, funny little jokes here and there. But uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I really I really enjoyed that. But um, you know, so so we can see that throughout you know the course of history since the novels come out, it has certainly taken on a life of its own, literally and figuratively. Um, you know, the monster has been reborn many many times. But um, I want to ask you guys, like when you read the book, as Ian you said, and it really was one of those books where you started to read it and you just got really pulled in do you remember anything that really stands out for you in the novel like was there a part of it that you really you were reading and you were just like oh my god and it, you still remember it today like just the story itself um hmm. i don't know what it was about it um I the just... part where the uh creature asked to um to be you know asked for a partner and he wants a female uh friend and doesn't want to be alone anymore yeah, that was an interesting wow. one too. But um, what I what I think strikes me most about the novel, um, and in some subsequent films that I've watched, but mostly the novel, because this is really for me where I I was most interested in it. Um, I find that m- many others that have followed have kind of let me down, <laughs> you know, in in terms of the visuals. Um, but it was really the description of Frankenstein, you know, Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory that intrigued me the most. And I, I don't know if it's because of my, you know, my sort of my science based mind, but I, I often imagined, you know, what it would be like going back to those times when we sort of take it for granted now, right? You know, electricity and all of these things that we have, these modern conveniences, but to a time where this was just really new, right? So, I mean, Mary Shelley's playing on that whole, you know, Benjamin Franklin kite string lightning strikes and the key and, you know, those kinds of things that today we take for granted, I guess, because, you know, we just have to switch on our light switch, right? <laughs> and, and we have electricity. But back then, it was really like a conjuring art. I don't know. I think that that's what what um, fascinated me was the harnessing of the lightning and the ability to, you know, turn that lightning into something that was life giving instead of life taking. It was. Uh, and and the laboratory itself and the, you know, sort of the concept of being able to stitch together multiple bodies uh, to, yeah. you know, to get them to, to work and then to use this electricity to essentially, you know, get the heart beating again and the blood flowing again. And I mean, there's, there's so many little things in her story that make me think that, you know, she was, a hundred years ahead of her time and her mind for, for what was actually happening. 
Yeah. And the whole science thing and the whole using, you know, parts from dead bodies to uh, and reanimating them, you know, is still a conversation we're having today. Yes, it is. Science. Exactly. I mean, it's it's kind of a it's it's somewhat mind boggling, right? And that's what I say. There's there's so many things here that her story touched on um, that are still very prevalent today in in slightly different ways. But um, you know, the fact that we can now essentially put somebody else's heart into another body or somebody else's lungs or eyes or you know, attach another arm or a hand or reattach fingers. Like there's just, you know, that, that, um, and I think what was so shocking about her novel in that time was, you know, being a very predominantly Christian society, what she was putting out there was playing God, essentially in the eyes of a lot of people, right? Science was playing God. And so I think that it was shocking to a lot of people in that respect, too, that it was, you know, it horrified them in, in more ways than just, <laughs> than just, you know, reanimating this creature and, and having it rampage around the countryside. And in reality, I, like I said, I felt sorry for the creature because it would be a bit like having amnesia. And not knowing where you are and not knowing who you are. And imagine yourself in a place where you know nobody and you look different from them. Right? So yeah, even exactly. even today. That's what I feel that I can relate with, yeah. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I find that. It's relatable I find, in some context. Yeah, and at the age of 20 that she was able to conceive all of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while today we might look at some of the the um, the science behind it very lacking, it's still a really cool concept for the time I find. Oh, and I should mention, of course, we forgot Rocky Horror Picture Show because that's really based on. Of course. (laughs) That's like the ultimate, you know, Frankenstein uh, tribute right there is is Rocky Horror. Uh, so you get a little bit of, of everything in there, right? Stage, film, songs, dance, controversy, reanimation, <laughs> everything. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know that most people read novels for the social commentary that they may get out of them. But I know at the time when I very first read Frankenstein, I think it was about 11 or 12 um, and I read it, and like I said, I was so intrigued by the, the laboratory and the science and the reanimation and the, you know, that that was really what got me. Um, and then I felt sorry for the monster because, you know, it, I, I kind of thought of it. And, yeah, I guess, Rachel, a bit like you, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I always kind of never really fit in with <laughs> Right. With with I, oh, I mean you know back when I was a goth I was always judged for my appearance and my looks you know yeah People I mean I, I didn't even go back to as when I was a child right I just remember because I didn't really think like other people and I I didn't really. Um, you know, I, I didn't want to play with dolls and, and do those kinds of things. I was more interested in going and digging things up and doing. You know, I, I was just, I was, I was a sideshow performer at the age of eight or nine already. I was catching giant water beetles and putting them in jars and, and, and getting people to pay me 10 cents to look at them. So, <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, I just really didn't, you know, so I think that there was some, there was some uh, connection to, to that, but I know for me today, when I ever I pick up that novel and just flip through it, I'm always reading that whole reanimation scene and the whole, um, you know, process and and feeling like Victor Frankenstein's frustration. And it, it, I think we we all sort of attach ourselves to different um, different narratives within within the story too. So, 
an interesting yeah. uh um, interesting so as movie. i say um if you can find a copy of that 1994 movie um watch it because it, oh, I'm sure it covers it. everything that you just spoke about mm-hmm. it's fantastic well, and it's Kenneth Branagh, so it should be pretty good <laughs> but yeah oh, no as, I, as I, I, will, say, I will look for it it's the best rendition of the story that i've seen on on film Okay, I'll have a you look know, at it. Down, I mean, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm weirdly skeptical about Robert De Niro in it, but again, he played done it some very well. Yeah, you, that... he wouldn't have been my first choice. No, as, um, as a, a as an actor in casting to to play that role, but he he pulls it off very well. But see, I kind of thought the same thing when I when I first saw the versions the the stage play with Benedict Cumberbatch and Johnny Lee Miller. I'm like about this right you know it's kind of like everybody sees benedict as kind of sherlock holmes and i see johnny mill johnny lee miller as sherlock holmes only you know the modern sherlock so now you've got two sherlocks both playing you know frankenstein's and dr frankenstein's um but it was very well done and like i said there was small nuances in there so i will definitely read i mean de niro's you know he's he's a lot more flexible than i think He's been typecast as, uh, for yes. the most part. You know, he's yes, always indeed. been typecast. Yep. A, a bit like Chris Walken, you know, Christopher Walken, he's been typecast so oh, many yeah. times too. And he's a far more versatile actor than people, you know, people see him as. But um, definitely have to watch that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's something. So for, for folks that are out there listening to us who maybe haven't picked up Frankenstein, um, and read it before. What what kind of what would you say to them, Ian? Like, what would you say about the book that make would might make them want to pick it up? It's just a very good story. As I say, it, I got pulled right into it um, yeah. almost immediately. And as I mentioned, there's not a lot of books that do that with me. That sometimes mm-hmm. it, it takes a, a little bit to get in, and this was one that I. And I was skeptical at first because reading it in college, um, I to start with, I didn't want to be taking an English class <laughs> because <laughs> I'd gone through all of too. that in high school. <laughs> and, and okay, so yeah, now I've got to take it in college as well. Right. Come on. And then, um, you know, we were presented in this English class. Um, okay, now we're going to read Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. And that's when I, you know, I start banging my head on the table. It's like, oh, come on, really? <laughs> but yeah, it only took a few pages, and I just fell in love with the book and the story. It, it's an amazing book. What about you, Rachel? What would you say? What? Uh, I'm sorry. I just uh, I got distracted there for a moment. I apologize. Oh um, no. Do give me a moment there. I'm sorry. It's not been a very good day for me. I'm not feeling well. Um, which book? Could you repeat the, that to me again, please? Oh, Frankenstein. Yeah, uh, I was just Rachel, saying, if, if, if you, you could, were to... If you could um, tell anyone who has not read the Frankenstein novel, um, yeah. why should they read it? Why should they read it? Oh, my gosh. Because it's... Um, I think it's important. I think it's, it was way ahead of its time. Um, I definitely think that... Uh, I mean, I, I know I didn't... When I took the book I had no idea no concept of um, how profound the actual book is and I would recommend that people should read it for its profoundness in in the sense that it's um, you know it it, it captures you know it's science and um, like moral you know it gives you a chance to question all these you know the way we behave in society you know, when people are shunning the monster, uh, you know, that's, it kind of, it, it, it makes us sad and we feel sympathy. But when, when the monster does things that are seen in, in the light that are, that are seen as bad um, and negative, you know, people are less sympathetic with the monster. And it just, I love how the story just throws us in so many different directions uh, emotionally. And you know, one minute we're like, yeah, I agree with the monster. You know, he shouldn't be treated like that. He shouldn't be treated that way. Um, but then he does something, you know, because he's angry and he has to lashes out out of anger and, you know, lives are lost. And, you know, well, you know, maybe he, maybe I'm not going to be as sympathetic to him as I, as I once was. So 